Hey guys, I'm Kai, hope you're doing well, and in this video I'm going to show you how I build a massive snake rack that can hold 72 tubs. Stick around, you're watching Lucas Landon Royals. Hey guys, I keep and breed ball pythons and I put them into enclosures that I custom build myself. In fact, majority of those snake racks you see behind me were built by me. I filmed the entire process, I put them on my YouTube channel so there are a ton of videos that I have of tutorials and DIYs that I have available to you so you can build your own. If you'd like to check them out, I'll put a link up here to that playlist of all of my DIY videos. If you like ball pythons and you want to build your own racks, make sure you're subscribed and ring that notification bell so you get informed when I upload new videos. Previously I showed you how I build a snake rack that can hold 48 tubs and that's this one that you see right here. Later on I added an addition above it so now it totals 64 tubs. Today in this video I'm going to show you how I built a rack that holds even more than that. This holds 72 tubs. I can't even get the entire rack into frame for you guys to see but believe me there are 72 tubs here. One of the reasons why I want to make another DIY video is because I often get asked for the measurements for the plans, the guides, and I'm happy to send them to you, but unless you're using the same exact tub, those measurements may not work. And that's because the cuts for my rack are all based on the tub size. So what I like to do in this video is show you how you can measure the tubs that are available to you in your area that you can get for a great value and then translate those measurements into the cuts that you need to build your racks. The first measurement that we want to take is the height of the tub plus a 1 8 inch gap. That 1 8 inch gap is going to allow airflow right at the top here. So those two combined is going to give you the spacing in between each of these levels. Now if you want multiple levels, you're going to take that spacing and multiply that by the number of levels. And don't forget to add a half of an inch for each one of these shelves in your rack. And that's going to give you the height for the two side panels for your rack. Now we can take the width of your tubs and you multiply that by the number of tubs that you want to go horizontally. In my case, I have six of them. So I multiply the width here by six. Then I added in a half of an inch just to give me some wiggle room in case I make a little bit of an error. And if you have supports like I have right here in the middle, remember to add the width of the support and this is going to be another half inch. So when you total up all of those values, that's going to give you the width of the interior shelves interior shelves. For the top and bottom level shelf, you're going to add one more inch because you have to account for the thickness of those side panels, which are half inch on one side, half inch on the other side, totaling one inch. So imagine if you have 33 inch long interior panels, the top one and the bottom one would just be 34 inch long. And the last measurement that you need to make off of your tub is the length of it plus a half of an inch. And that's going to give you the total width for your rack, the width meeting front to back measurement. So now you know the length for the two side panels, you know the length for your interior levels, and you know the length for the top and bottom level. The width is constant for all of those pieces. Once I had my measurements, it was time to go get all the materials. Now I went down to my local Home Depot, picked up a sheet of half inch plywood, a couple beams of 2x4 lumber, and a couple sheets of half inch PVC. Now these come in 4 foot by 8 foot sheets. I was building this in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, so there was a lockdown and there were social distancing rules in place. Because of that, Home Depot wouldn't cut the materials for me like they usually do. In fact, all of their heavy machinery were turned off. So instead, I had to bring my circular saw and a few other tools. I used one of their flatbed carts as a table and I cut all the materials in their parking lot and then did a few fine cuts when I got home. But regardless of COVID or not, you should really make sure you have all the materials available to you and that includes the tubs. Get all the tubs that you need because you never know when the store is going to run out. Once everything is cut down to size, I bring everything into my house and start assembling. I'm going to start by building a rolling base for the rack to eventually sit on. The footprint of the rack is going to determine the cuts for the lumber. All the lumber is going to be held together with two screws at each corner. 
I like to make pilot holes for the screws, especially since these screws are so close to the edge of the lumber, the pilot hole is going to prevent that lumber from splitting when the screws are driven in. All the lumber are 2x4s except for the brace that goes in the middle. I ran out of material so I'm just using a 2x3 for the center brace. Having a rolling base is great because it's going to make moving the entire rack around your snake room much easier and quicker. Also it keeps the rack off of the floor so that it's not sitting on a cold cement floor like I have in my basement. You'll also see later that I'm going to build the rack in three sections and then I will assemble all three of those sections on top of the rolling base. Because the base has wheels, it's going to be able to move around while I assemble those three sections together, just making it easier for myself. These screws have a protective coating. They are two and a half inch exterior screws. To mark out the center brace, I just divide the total length into half and then put a mark on both of the long sides. Then line up the center brace with the two marks and attach them. This may look a little awkward right now, but that's because this base is upside down. I purposely built the base upside down because I'm using the level table surface to ensure that the top of the base is going to be flat. Once the center is attached, flip it over and this becomes the top. Now we want to think about protecting the wood and to do that we're going to brush on a coat of paint. Color doesn't really matter, but the finish does. Pick something that is semi-gloss to gloss. I like using white because it gives it the clean look. A couple thin coats is what you want to aim for. Make sure you get everything covered, and that's much better than putting on one thick coat. Once the paint is thoroughly dried, we can attach the casters. These I got from Home Depot. Two of them swivel and will be attached towards the back of the rack. And then the other two also swivel but have the locking mechanism. Those will go towards the front of the rack. Now, as I'm attaching them, I make sure the caster plates overlap where the lumber joins so that it supports both pieces of lumber. And when the screws are attached, it's going to lock those two pieces of lumber together even more so. Even though the caster plate comes with four holes, I'm attaching them with three drywall screws. Now the base is done, we'll set this aside and we'll work on the bottom piece of the rack. This is lumber, so it needs to be protected as well. I'm using the same paint, but this time just one coat is enough. There's really not much more I can say about paint. I think everybody knows how to paint. So we'll just move on to the next part. Let's get down to building the actual rack itself. These are the side panels to a third of the rack. Remember I said I'm going to be building this rack in three sections. So this is going to serve as the bottom section. First thing I want to do is measure out where the horizontal pieces will attach to these side panels. You can see I put a piece of tape on the ruler to make it easier to find. That way every mark is going to be equal distance apart. I put an X on the side of the mark where another piece of PVC will attach to it. Then I put the two side panels side by side and transfer those marks to the other piece so that they're mirror images of each other. These marks need to be precise. Taking a little bit extra time to make sure they're right will allow the assembly process to go much smoother and quicker. If you make a mistake here, erasing a pencil mark is much easier than trying to take apart the rack later down the road. Now we're going to start joining them together and to do that, I'm using these corner clamps as an extra set of hands. If you don't have these corner clamps, I highly, highly suggest you get a few because they are well worth the money and they're not really that expensive. The first two pieces that I want to join together is one of these side panels and the very bottom panel which is made out of plywood that we painted earlier and set to dry. And the way I put them together is so that the bottom piece overlaps the thickness of the side panel. Here's where these corner clamps really come into play. Not only do they hold the corners together, they hold the two pieces tight against each other and at a perfect 90 degree angle.
Now comes a point where we can actually screw these pieces together. And this is gonna be a three step process. First, I make the pilot holes. Because it's so close to the edge and we are working with lumber, there's a tendency for the screw to split the material. So a pilot hole is gonna prevent that from happening. The next step would to be use a larger drill bit to bore out a little bit of a negative space for the screw head to sit in. The screws that I'll be using are 1 inch number 6 flat Phillips head screws. The screw heads are flat so they can sit flat with the material and not protrude out and scratch anything. The last step of this three part process is to drive the screw in. I use three screws at each of these corners. Once these two pieces are screwed together, I'm going to move on to screwing the other side panel to the bottom panel as well. Same exact process. And later on in this video, I'm going to use the same joining method to screw on the top panel to the two side panels. This can actually go a little bit quicker if you work in a more assembly line fashion where you make all the holes, prep them, and then put in all the screws. Now things are going to move a little bit quicker as we start to attach the interior shelf pieces. Again, I'm using the corner clamps as an extra set of hands. And as for screws, I'm using two at each end. The screws that I'm using here are Phillips head and 1 4th inch long, but they're number eights and the head is a little bit wider in diameter to give it a better holding power. I still drill pilot holes for these screws, but I don't have to bore out that negative space. Essentially, I'm skipping step two of the three step process. Installing these panels is kind of repetitive, but you do get to develop a rhythm which makes things move a little bit quicker. Here's a different angle as I install the last interior piece. I'm still using these corner clamps. They're terrific for this project. And you can see these screws actually protrude from the material itself rather than the other screws that sit flush with the material. These screws have a rounded head. The reason is the side panel doesn't have to butt up with any other material, so it's okay that these screw heads protrude. Notice how I only have one screw holding in the panel. Later on, I'm going to stand the entire unit on its side and then put in the second set of screws. The final piece that goes on is the top and you guys already know how to attach this because it's exactly the same way as I had attached the bottom piece. Again, I'm using corner clamps, pilot holes, and then the screw. There's one small difference here, which is I don't have to bore out the negative space for the screw head because PVC is less dense and more flexible than wood. I found out I can torque the screw into the plastic PVC. Here I'm tipping the entire unit on its side. I just found that it's easier to drill downwards as opposed to sideways and it's better on my back. After building a few of these racks, you find ways to work more comfortably. So here I'm putting a screw through the side panel into the interior panel so that each panel is held to the side panel with two screws on this side. Then I flip the entire unit over to the other side and repeat the same process. Remember the rolling base that we made earlier? Well, this is where we start using it. I place the entire unit onto the rolling base, making sure that the bottom plywood piece of the rack is in contact with the rolling base. Now we can easily roll this out of the way so that we have space to work on the second section to our humongous hatchling rack. The second section will be assembled in a similar manner to what we did with the first section. The only difference is this is slightly scaled down. The first section had five levels. This section is just going to have four levels and no bottom plywood panel. This is kind of repetitive, so I'm going to speed things up, but you should watch it and see if you can identify and recall all the steps. And this is that middle section. It's almost done. It's right side up. But what I have to do is flip it over so that I can prep the bottom to attach to the section that we made earlier. To join the two sections together, I'm going to use what's called a dowel system. I'm going to start by making a template out of a piece of paper so that every hole that I drill will line up. And that's because a dowel system is basically a short cylindrical piece of material that gets sandwiched in between two holes. The template is made by lining the paper up at the edge of the material and crimping it down then using a pencil to mark out the folds. The folds and the lines were going to be used to position this template at each corner of the rack where a hole needs to be drilled. 
but that gets placed in the center where the hole is going to get drilled. I don't even need to use a ruler, it doesn't matter as long as every hole lines up, we're golden. I drill a hole right on that dot. It's really important that the drill bit goes straight down perpendicular to the material. And you can see here, I'm using a small drill bit. This is the same drill bit I was using to drill pilot holes for the screws. The reason I use the smaller bit is because it gives me more precision. Later on, I'm gonna come back with a larger drill bit and make the hole wider. The template then gets moved over to the other side of the rack using the folds in the line to line up the template into position and then drilling a hole. Now it's time to drill those holes on the bottom section of the rack and here again is where that rolling base really comes in handy. And here again using the same template on the bottom section of the rack. The template is placed at the top two corners lining up with the pencil lines and then drilling the holes. Once all four holes are drilled with a small drill bit, I come back and bore out the hole with a larger drill bit that matches the size of the dowel. And then I insert the two dowels, one on each side of the rack. Now comes the most dramatic change where the two sections are finally joined together. And you can see how the dowels guide and align the two sections as they come together. I'm not using glue just yet because we have to address the slack on all of these interior levels. And to do that, I've cut out some small blocks to use as supports. The slightly wider ones will go into the front and the thinner ones will go in the back. The back ones are thinner to allow space for the heat tape. Before we can glue those supports into place, we have to first measure out where they're supposed to go. I've decided that they should go dead center. So I divide the length into half and that's where I make the mark. I put a mark on the tape measure and then transfer that mark onto the PVC. I mark all the levels on the front, as well as mark all the levels on the back. Now the supports are ready to be glued, and then for that I'm just using PVC cement. A little dab on the top and the bottom will do, and they just go in pretty simply. Make sure you go from the bottom up. And here is how it's done. Once the bottom section has all of its supports, we're ready to glue the top section to the bottom section. To glue the two large sections together, I'm using the same PVC cement. You can use a Q-tip, you can use a paintbrush. I'm just using a folded up piece of paper to apply a little bit of the cement to where the two sections will join. Now it's almost complete, just have to finish inserting the remaining supports on the top half of this rack. In the beginning, I did say that this huge rack is going to be assembled in three sections. I've already shown you how to build two of those sections. Showing you how to build a third section would just be too repetitive. So that's it for this DIY build. I ended up not building that third section that goes on top because I already had a three tier hashing rack with the same footprint as the one we just built. I was able to just to lift that up and place it on top. That's why you see this double layer right here. Uh, this way I can take this off if I ever have to move this out of the room, make sure I have plenty of clearance to clear that doorway. Now, one of the reasons I made this video is because I had some improvements to my previous design and I want you guys to have the latest and greatest so you can build the best rack possible. Now you just need to finish off the rack with your own heating elements and temperature controllers and a back panel. If you wanna see how I did it, I have a very detailed heating DIY video and I'll put a card to that right here so you guys can check it out. That about wraps it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. If you're new to this channel and you wanna be informed of future uploads, make sure you're subscribed and ring that notification bell. As always, thanks for watching. Please share and I'll see you guys next time.